Okay, a very good evening, everyone, and a very happy Independence Day to all of you. Today, I, Dr. Kumal Lalwani, on behalf of Nationwide Quality of Care Network, welcome you all to today's community of practice session. The session is on improving the quality of neonatal care using gen genomics. Now, without further ado, I would like to call upon Professor Vikram Datta. Professor Vikram Datta is the Director Professor at the Department of Neonatology, Lady Harding Medical College, New Delhi. He is the President of Nationwide Quality of Care Network and Vice President of National Neonatology Forum, India. He is a Guest Editor of PMJ Open Quality South Asia Edition. He is a member of Editorial Board by International General for Quality in Healthcare Communication. He is expert at the International Society for Quality in Healthcare. He is a lead at National Mentoring Group and Technical Resource Group Lead for Sustainable Model for Laksha by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, India. He is the member of Quality, Equity and Dignity Working Group by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, India. Sir, I request you to please give us opening remarks and welcome our speaker and panelists for today's session. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Komal. I wish to extend my greetings on the 75th Independence Day of India. I think what an auspicious occasion to have Dr. Pankaj Agarwal addressing the communities of practice in this session. And uh, we have a very eminent panel, friends, as you all have taken time out on a very important day for a very novel topic. I have the pleasure of introducing a very eminent panel today. We have with us as the lead speaker, Dr. Pankaj Agarwal. Dr. Pankaj Agarwal needs no introduction to this group. However, for the larger audience, he is a global authority and he is working in the field of neonatal genomics. He is the Merton Banfield Chair in Neonatal Newborn Medicine at Boston Children's Hospital, Boston, Massachusetts. He is the Director of the Neonatal Genomics Program at the Boston Children's Hospital, which is focusing on understanding the role of genomic technologies in newborn care and screening. Pankaj is also the Medical Director at the Manton Center for Gene Discovery at the Boston Children's Hospital, a Principal Investigator of the Agarwal's Laboratory at the Boston Children's Hospital, and additionally, an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the Harvard Medical School, Boston, Massachusetts, Associate Member of the Board Institute of MIT and Harvard. And he has to his credit, a publication of more than 130 papers in several high impact journals. Pankaj has received several awards for his clinical and research work and has presented in research in several national and international forums and conferences. I happen to be privileged to be meeting Pankaj off and on in the Pediatric Academic Society's meeting during the course of my travel to the US. And I'm very happy and privileged that Pankaj at short notice has agreed to be a part of this Communities of Practice platform, which is focusing exclusively on strategies, which are the evolving strategies as well as the strategies which improve the quality of care of maternal and newborn patients across the Southeast Asia region. Welcome Pankaj. And once again, on this occasion of the 75th Independence Day of our country, we welcome you to the communities of practice for Southeast Asia supported by WHO CRO. I have the pleasure of introducing the other panelists, a colleague and a friend from Banaras Hindu University, Dr. Neerja Gupta, currently working as a distinguished additional professor, Division of Genetics at Department of Pediatrics, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Dr. Neerja Gupta is a genetic expert par excellence, and she has been providing support to all the problems which our neonatal units face related to genomics and genetics. And she's always been very approachable and has helped us solve multiple riddles which are associated with this complex topic. Neerja is a coordinator and of the quality assurance at the WHO Bird Defect Surveillance Program across the Southeast Asia region. And she has been a past treasurer of the SIAMG. Her areas of interest range from management of inherited metabolic disorders, lysosomal storage disorders, genomics of intellectual disability, skeletal dysplasias, arthrogryposis, and fetal autopsy. Neerja has over 178 publications and 20 book chapters, and she is the recipient of the prestigious 8th 
Dr. I.C. Verma Excellence in Research Award for Young Pediatricians 2020. Welcome, Neerja, to this Communities of Practice session. And finally, I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Alpana Rajdan. Dr. Alpana is a Vice President and Head of Lab Services at Gene Strings Diagnostic Center Private Limited. She's working on an ICMR funded project on autism spectrum disorder where they are looking at the genetics related to the autism spectrum disorder. And we would like to hear more about her work later in the course of this session today. Dr. Alpana has more than 20 years of experience in genomics, reproductive health science, next generation sequencing technology, high output automated DNA sequencing, MLPA, RT-PCR, microarray, and forensics. And she's a PhD holder in clinical research and training in forensic genetics and DNA database technology at the University of North Texas Health Science Centers, Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences. And I would also like to introduce Alpana as one of the leads who is uh, conducting the RT-PCR tests at the international arrivals terminal of the Delhi airport. And during the peak of the pandemic, their company has provided support to the government of India by rendering very quick turnaround time and tackling the COVID pandemic in the Indian subcontinent. So welcome all of you. I also have on the panel, Dr. Madhulika Kavra, and I'm sure ma'am uh, will be joining the panel very soon. I will request Dr. Sonam to uh, uh, just uh, invite madam to the panel from the participant link. Dr. Madhulika Kavra is heading the genetics division at All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And she's a trained geneticist and a researcher par excellence. So welcome Dr. Kabra and all my colleagues from NQCN. Now I have the pleasure of handing over the stage and the screen to Dr. Pankaj Agarwal for his deliberations. Over to you Pankaj, the screen is all yours. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, Dr. Datta and uh, everyone. Uh, today I'm um, so excited to be here and giving this talk. Let me just, uh, it is uh, such an auspicious day uh, for India's uh, uh, freedom of 75 years uh, completion. So it's such an honor. And also I was amazed at the type of work, uh, the, the amount of work you have done, uh, Dr. Datta and your team. And like, I think you established in 10 years back or so, and what an amazing achievement you've done. So congratulations to you and your team. And I would also say that I'm not a QI expert, just uh, letting you know. And I, I'm uh, ready to learn from you as well. So with that introduction, I'm going to share my screen. All right, I hope you can see it. So uh, I'm going to be talking about how we can uh, make a difference in the neonatal care using various genomic technologies and, uh, and where is the future lies. And, uh, and I, I wanted to tell a little bit about the story of my own career. So. I was, I don't know if many of you know, but I was at PGI, uh, I did DM in neonatology at PGI. And then um, I wanted to do research. Uh, and for that, I was looking for places uh, where I can go. I first went to Monash and also found that the research, uh, at least in those days, uh, was not uh, was were not very exciting. Uh, so I decided to go to Boston Children's Hospital and I did a fellowship there. And during that time, I also did a master's in medical science at Harvard. And uh, that really opened my eyes to a lot of uh, new options in terms of research. I did a course on biostatistics, epidemiology. And then while doing the fellowship, I and also genomics. And uh, uh, during my fellowship, I took care of this, uh, uh, this kid, I would say, who was born when I was doing fellowship. And he was born with the condition that we just could not figure out uh, uh, Initially, we thought it was hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy because the child didn't move uh, soon after birth and we thought it's related to perinatal asphyxia. But eventually we thought that this is a little unusual and, uh, and then it took us six months to diagnose this, uh, this boy with a condition called myotubular myopathy. And, and the genetic diagnosis was made. We found a mutation in a gene called MTM1. Uh, and that really prompted me to think of like how, how we are like uh, supposedly number one hospital and we take such a long time in diagnosis uh, of, of a condition like this. 
So I wanted to do some work on genomics uh, in terms of uh, these myopathies. So uh, these are the parents of the child. And uh, this is, uh, was my mentor, Dr. Alan Baggs, whose lab I started working in. And then uh, soon after I got interested in more uh, different types of rare diseases and then established a new program at Boston Children's uh, with the neonatal genomics program. So that's my journey. I just wanted to tell you how I started in genomics and uh, where I am now. So in terms of the role of genomics in newborn care, I, I wanted to divide this topic into uh, several uh, different uh, under subtopics. First is that what's the role of genomics in NICU? Uh, and I will uh, talk more about it in more detail a little bit later. Then what's it? Does it have a role in healthy newborns? And then molecular autopsy, how we can implement genomics and resource poor uh, NICUs, and then building a neonatal genomics program at my own place. And I'm today I'm not gonna talk about research opportunities that have come from this uh, gen applying genomics in the newborn care, including gene discovery and how we are reanalyzing exome or genome data to help, uh, help our patients with uh, various rare disease that remain undiagnosed. Uh, so, Dr. Pankaj, if I can, yes. uh, sorry for the interruption. If you could make the screen full screen. Oh, it's make not. The window full screen. Yeah. Hold on. Let me just make it easier for all of us. Is it better now? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yep. So, uh, yeah, genetic disorders in the NICU, we think uh, by some of our own estimates is like responsible for 10 to 20% of the NICU admissions. Uh, this is especially true in like level three, level four NICUs where they also take care of a lot of referrals uh, like our center uh, itself. And many of these infants uh, with a suspected genetic disorder undergo a long, a difficult, costly, and potentially invasive diagnostic odyssey. And uh, can we short uh, change it by just doing one test? And then selecting an appropriate genetic test can be challenging, uh, especially due to the difficulties identifying a specific phenotype in a critically ill infant. So I'm sure you have seen uh, this situation where, uh, and I showed you uh, this, uh, this child as well, with born floppy, doesn't move any muscle. And, and then the, usually uh, the neonatologists ask neurologists and metabolic team and genetics team, and then go through all this testing which is pretty expensive and, uh, and time-taking and uh, thinking, thinking uh, of replacing all this different testing by just one test, like an exome or a genome sequencing. It can save so much time and money and uh, effort. Uh, and also uh, it can uh, prevent uh, the child from going through all these different testing, uh, invasive testing, and uh, thinking of uh, that becoming a standard of care. Uh, so I just wanted to briefly introduce you different genetic testing in the NICU that is done. Uh, starting with karyotype, again, we do karyotype occasionally in rare times when we are uh, we are suspecting, for example, trisomy 21 and a possible Robertsonian translocation. And then FISH, FISH is available for a lot of conditions as well. For example, trisomy 18, 13, 21, uh, and uh, 22Q11 deletions. And then microarray is becoming a lot more common these days. Uh, with the ability to detect more submicroscopic chromosomal deletions, duplications, and it can also detect areas of homozygosity, and that can suggest uh, consanguinity or uniparental disomy, uh, which means both the chromosomes are coming from one parent, uh, and which makes you makes makes the child uh, recessive for uh, for that uh, that part of the chromosome. And then these were approaches that were used in the past, like targeted mutation analysis, single gene sequencing deletion duplication analysis, methylation is becoming more and more common nowadays, and then panels, uh, which are often sent by geneticists, and then exome sequencing and genome sequencing. So my, my focus is going to be on whole exome or whole genome, because I think a lot of these testing will eventually be replaced by the, these two approaches. So just for people who are not very familiar with exome or genome, it's you take the sample, you fragment it, and attach the adapters and then capture, uh, followed by uh, reference, uh, aligning it with the reference genome. For whole genome, you are aligning with the entire genome, but exome, you're only focusing on the coding region of the genome, which is about one to 2% of genome. And then targeted gene panel, we are just focusing on the genes that are known to be associated uh, with the condition. 
And then I'm sure you have seen uh, some of the interpretation aspects of sequencing where uh, you will see uh, pathogenic or likely pathogenic, which are pretty straightforward. And then benign or likely benign uh, variants are also quite straightforward, but something which often um, bogs us down is the variant of un unknown significance or uncertain significance. And these, these are also fairly common. Uh, you will see in a lot of genetic reporting uh, that a variant is described as VUS or variant of uncertain significance, which makes the job even more challenging. So what's the history of rapid sequencing in the NICU? Uh, the first demonstration of utility of rapid exome sequencing was in 2010 when a paper was published by NG et al. Uh, in Nature Genetics showing uh, diagnosis of Miller syndrome by using this approach. Uh, and then in the NICU in 2012, uh, Stephen Kingsmore and his team found uh, utility of rapid sequencing in the NICU where they did the 50-hour genome sequencing and found that they could do, diagnose uh, four out of five infants with a molecular, uh, molecular genetic diagnosis and uh, it has the potential to shorten the diagnostic odyssey. And since then, many studies have come from many centers all around the world that have shown that it can really cut down uh, the time taken for diagnosis, and it can also improve, uh, improve the number of cases that are diagnosed, uh, helping uh, clinicians on the way. And then we have performed our own research and, and then our pilot study to show that how useful this is in, in taking care of our babies. So for example, in 2009, we had a pair of twins who were born at 38 week gestation. Uh, they had abgars of eight and eight, but within first day of life, they both started to have seizures. Unfortunately, twin A died at two weeks and the twin B was admitted to our NICU. So their family uh, was from Virginia and they decided to come to Boston Children's for further care. <coughs> Excuse me. So this was the EEG early on. As you can see, there is some birth suppression pattern that seem to evolve into something much more disorganized over time. And uh, based on the early EEG, a diagnosis of Odhara syndrome was made. Child also went through a serial MRIs. Uh, this is the first MRI at two months, but then subsequently there were these shadows seen on diffusion weighted imaging that suggested some kind of mitochondrial disorder, but then it went away by two and a half years of age. So it was very unusual that uh, the MRI evolution over time. Uh, which further confused everyone like what we are dealing with. Uh, and then the child who had died uh, and the autopsy was done and showed this dentato all the very dysplasia in the cerebellum, which is again a non-specific. We don't know what to make of it. Uh, and the child has a pretty terrible course, in fact, had uh, and also a lot of testing, including uh, a panel, gene panel for seizures, CMA, mitochondrial genome, mitochondrial panel that was available at that time also received multiple uh, anti-seizure meds, uh, including Keppra, sodium valproate, clonopin, top topiramate. Uh, uh, interestingly, this child eventually got weaned off all these drugs and uh, is now seizure-free, except occasional febrile seizures. So this parents, uh, uh, he's now eight-year-old, uh, uh, or maybe not eight, sorry, 12-year-old, uh, it's a lot uh, older story now. This uh, parents wanted to have more kids, so they enrolled in our research. So that time I was running this Benton Center and we were enrolling these patients who were remain undiagnosed uh, despite clinical, uh, uh, clinical uh, all, uh, uh, all aspects of clinical care and they didn't, still didn't have a diagnosis. So we did a whole genome sequencing and uh, we found that the child in fact was, had a variant in a gene called SCN2A and that was the first description of SCN2A gene, which is a sodium channel to be linked to Odahara syndrome. Uh, uh, luckily, we had tissue from the twin who had died, and we confirmed that both the twins uh, carried the same variant, and the parents were, uh, uh, did not carry the variant, uh, which made it a de novo mutation. Since then, they have three more kids, and they're all normal. And this is the family visiting us uh, many, many years back. Uh, this is the child. And this is the paper we published in Epilepsia saying that the uh, first description of SCN2A uh, associated with Odhara syndrome. But subsequently, and we have uh, enrolled many more patients since then, but then we did a systematic study, a case control study in 2017-18, where we studied uh, NICU babies within a week of admission and uh, analyzed trio exome within five days of enrollment to study the diagnostic yield time to diagnosis impact on care and number of diagnostic tests and costs. 
And these are some of the phenotypes that we chose uh, early on to say that we are going to target such patients which are having unexplained hypotonia or seizures or multiple anomalies, and then other of these conditions that are listed here. So we approached 57 families, we enrolled 52 and were able to sequence 50 of them. Uh, two of them decided to withdraw from the study before sequencing could be sent. And out of 50 of them, 29 had a definitive or likely diagnosis. In fact, early in the study, we had a pretty high uh, success rate, but then dropped as we included more sites and became a little bit difficult to uh, make sure that we exactly follow the criteria of, of uh, enrollment. And so we have uh, gotten the data from 21 cases that were undiagnosed, and uh, we have found novel genes from this, uh, these patients, and uh, that's work is ongoing uh, right now. But in terms of how this sequencing made a difference, there's that uh, there was one patient who had a CN2A mutation who was more responsive to phenytoin uh, for seizure control. Uh, so that's another thing that if you have a seizure gene like a CN2A, it may really change uh, the type of drug you're using for seizures. One of them uh, was potential uh, for uh, a gene therapy trial, and then there was one uh, who uh, we could obtain the emergency IND for a compassionate use therapy. But in addition to the direct therapeutic effect benefits, there were also other benefits that uh, often uh, people ignore, uh, like uh, getting to refer to additional specialists. For example, and we may not know that this condition is associated with an endocrine condition, uh, maybe a hypothyroidism or uh, the hypocortisol levels. So having that specialist can uh, detect these conditions sooner and can start treatment early. It can also help the families with reproductive decisions, just like I gave an example of that earlier family who was able to decide to have more kids based on the fact that the mutation was de novo and the recurrence risk is about two to 3%. It can also increase. Uh, uh, we can, it can also improve uh, the rapid long-term management decisions. For example, uh, families may decide to go for all types of treatment, uh, and uh, they can want. They may want tracheostomy or gastrostomy or different types of intervention that can be expedited rather than waiting for diagnosis and knowing what what we are dealing with. And then in, in a few cases, we could also provide early comfort care. So there was a kid we recently published who had a flesh nyhan syndrome diagnosis made by uh, exome and uh, microarray. And uh, that family decided to redirect care because they thought that the quality of, of a child's life going forward would be really poor. Uh, since this uh, study, we have integrated this rapid exome sequencing in our own NICU. So phase one was a study team that we I already talked about, and phase two, we have integrated now rapid exome sequencing into our routine, routine uh, clinical care. And this is a little bit different from doing a study. We don't have a definitive enrollment criteria, so we go by whatever geneticists tell us and whatever we see as, uh, as a team very interested in uh, uh, genomics to, to make sure that we can get sequencing done. And uh, there is uh, rotating a clinical team member, they're competing clinical demand, so it's not as ideal as running a research. But what we have seen is that uh, out of the 230 patients who had a genetics referral, uh, which is about 20-25% of our total census, uh, 80 of them we could get a rapid exome sequencing. And if you see that a lot of these patients had a neurologic condition, as p-value shown here, less than 0.001, or they needed respiratory support, uh, and that shows here, or they died by 12 months of age, or they had a long NICU stay. So all this was associated with the higher chances of getting a rapid sequencing done. In the phase two of our study, we could uh, send 35% uh, of patients for sequencing out of uh, 230, and the diagnostic yield was 28%. Uh, and only one case where rapid exome sequencing missed the diagnosis because of repeat expansion, which uh, those of you who you know how, you know how exome sequencing works can understand that for repeat expansion, we need a genome uh, or even a long range uh, genome rather than a, uh, sometimes uh, uh, other te uh, technology based on short reads. So uh, that's something that can be missed. Uh, but overall, it's a pretty good test as, as a first line. And we had a similar or higher diagnostic yield and uh, less time taken from consult to result uh, uh, compared to other genetic tests. So then I'm going to move to the healthy newborns. What's the role of sequencing in uh, healthy newborns? So we did a study called BabySeq. Uh, some of you may have heard of it. 
So this is a statement from uh, Francis Collins, who was the director of NIH uh, till recently. And he said that over the course of next few decades, the availability of cheap, efficient DNA sequencing will lead to a medical landscape in which each baby's genome is sequenced. And that information is used to shape a lifetime of personalized strategies for disease prevention, detection, and treatment. So is this the crystal ball that we have been waiting for? Uh, that's the question. There's some advantage, but if you think about what genomic screening can do, it can find treatable pediatric disease, it can diagnose affected infants, it can also provide some early warning for certain risks, for example, thrombosis in patients with central line, <coughs> or uh, optimal use of certain drugs like genomics, or it can help with reproductive planning for families. But then it can be a source of anxiety for families, it can impact the parent-child relationship, they may also learn about something about late onset, like a disease like Huntington disease, which often presents later in life. And if a newborn is diagnosed with that condition, uh, think of the state the parents will be in if they know that their child, when he's going to turn 50, is going to develop Huntington disease. So, is this the right thing to do when you are when you're born when a baby is born to, to tell them about uh, this late onset disease risk? Uh, and then there are other issues like stigmatization, discrimination, insurance issues, especially in the U.S. And then discovery of non-paternity, also we have seen a few cases there. So to know the real role of genomic sequencing in screening newborns, we did this study where we enrolled babies from um, well baby nursery and ICUs and then randomized them to sequencing versus non-sequencing arm. Uh, and then uh, we looked at, uh, we wanted to report only pathogenic or likely pathogenic, highly penetrant variants for childhood onset conditions, but we also subsequently decided to report some actionable adult onset conditions and then report carrier status for recessive conditions. Uh, and then uh, if the patient does develop a phenotype or has a phenotype, then we looked at VUSs as well. If, I, if you remember, I talked about variant of unknown significance or uncertain significance, and that was also reported uh, for, for a particular phenotype. So we also enrolled the physicians. We also studied the impact of sequencing on families. So. What is the impact of sequencing on individual and public health? What is the impact on physician and family behavior? And what is the impact on healthcare system? All, all are very pertinent questions when we want to think of using sequencing in healthy newborns, especially. Uh, this, this, is a, this is a topic that uh, needs further research, but I'm gonna share some of the results we found. So we, as I said, that it was a randomized study. We randomized ICU babies and well newborns into, uh, into both uh, sequenced and non-sequenced arms. And there were 68 babies in the ICU, uh, uh, in the ICU that were enrolled and 257 well babies that were enrolled. And then we uh, randomized them to standard of care versus uh, getting a genome report. And then it also, if the child does develop a symptom or a finding that may be potentially genetic, also we reanalyze to look for any indication-based finding. And same thing for well babies as well. And then uh, we did uh, sequencing results disclosure to the families and then uh, also involved the pediatricians uh, and then looked at what the impact is uh, of all these uh, maneuvers. Uh, so this is, uh, this is overall, we found that in fact, 11% of our babies who were sequenced. So if you remember, we had half of them were randomized sequencing. So 159 of them were sequenced. 18 of them had uh, uh, variants that were, in, were pathogenic or likely pathogenic. Only one of them uh, explained uh, the known clinical phenotype for a gene called ANKRD11, which causes KBG syndrome. And then three of them uh, explained partial phenotype. But then we found a lot of variants where the kids were totally fine. Uh, and they had uh, these pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant in all these genes. Some of them had, seven of them had family history of disease and seven of them did not have family history of disease. Essentially these patients, these babies were normal, their parents were normal, but in the parents, of these seven that were had family history of disease, there were extended family members who, who had some evidence of a disease, uh, and that may have been linked uh, to, the, uh, to the gene that variant that we found. And the other thing we found was that about up to 90% or 88% of uh, infants had were carriers for uh, uh, recessive genes. So that tells us that all of us or most of us have are carrying variants for recessive genes in our genome. And if we do marry or if we do have a partner who has, uh, who happens to have a variant in the same gene, there is a 25% risk of developing a recessive disorder. Uh, for example, this family, 
This was one of the families that was, was enrolled by us, a healthy newborn. He carried four different recessive vari variants. And these parents decided that they want to uh, go for sequencing uh, for both the parents for all four genes. And in fact, uh, the way, even though the child was a carrier for CTNS, both parents uh, carried a CTNS variants, which means that they were lucky that this child did not develop a recessive disorder or CTNS related disorder, but there was a 25% risk. So they pursued pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or PGD as we call it for future pregnancy. Uh, we also surveyed the families and physicians and uh, this work is ongoing, but physicians at this time are not too excited. I'm gonna just summarize. At this time, they feel like it can have utility for uh, more predicting future disease risk, but not so much for uh, identifying patient condition and managed care at this time, but in 10 years, 10 years, it may be even better than newborn screening. So uh, it's a moving target. Uh, I think uh, a lot needs to be done and we still need to understand uh, what, what is the utility of newborn, um, uh, uh, newborn sequencing. And I'm talking more only of the healthy newborns here. So just, uh, just bear with me that we are not talking about NICU infants who have a likely genetic condition. This is only for healthy newborns who we are just doing sequencing to figure out what risks they carry and what type of disease they may develop or uh, what are their. So it's a very different goal compared to uh, the NICU infants. But uh, at this time, uh, there is essentially consensus that we are not ready for uh, sequencing healthy newborns. These are some of the findings I'm not going to go through again, but uh, for the sake of time. Uh, but this, uh, this study raised a lot of questions as, as, uh, as answers as well. So it was uh, covered extensively by the media when, when we published this paper in 2019. Uh, so yields some answers, but more questions. And uh, there was a pretty big team of people who were involved in this study and, uh, and as leadership, uh, as part of the leadership team. I was very fortunate to be part of this amazing study. I'm going to move to the molecular autopsy. Like uh, I want to show an example of a case that we were able to solve by using this approach. And this was a patient who was born at 41 weeks, uh, first day of life, developed some pallor, hypertonia, and poor feeding. He failed hearing screen. He had some minor abnormalities on MRI. And then the team, neurology, genetics, they were all consulted. And they couldn't find anything. Microarray was sent, it was negative. Child was sent home on day of life 18 on caffeine and oxygen saturation monitor, uh, hoping that child was do, will do fine. But three days later, had several episodes of apnea, and then he was admitted to our, our hospital this time. Uh, and this time uh, he was diagnosed to have multifocal seizures. His brain MRI was absolutely abnormal. Uh, he also showed an increased lactate peak. And again, the metabolic neurology, everyone was consulted and nothing came back uh, positive. So it was a diagnostic challenge. Uh, at that time, we were doing this study, so we uh, collected the samples for DNA extraction and uh, sequencing, and then also skin biopsy for fibroblasts. Patient died on day of life 27, and uh, autopsy also didn't show much, except some CNS atrophy and hep hepatic steatosis and LVH. So we did rapid sequencing, and we found two variants, and one pathogenic and one VUS. So that was uh, HIBCH is one of those... Uh, enzymes that is involved in valein catabolism and is associated with Leigh syndrome. But because C4OH in this child was normal, they said that this is not consistent with this condition. So is, is, is this finding a by chance or is it real? Um, and also the disease was more severe in the child compared to what's reported in the literature. So it was no, there was no consensus among clinicians. But luckily, because we had saved the fibroblasts, we sent them to the a lab in Europe that does uh, HIBCH activity and found that the child was severely deficient in HIBCH activity. And, uh, and that was, uh, that confirmed the diagnosis and all the clinicians now agreed that this is the right diagnosis for this child. And uh, the family used this information for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and I have two healthy boys. But uh, thanks to our work, our efforts, they were very kind to start fundraising for us. And these are the parents. Uh, and they first raised uh, $72,000 in 2018. And then this year they raised $171,000 and, um, and they are helping us continue this type of work in, in, in my laboratory. So just to say, just a, a recent paper we published where we showed that the, about 50% uh, of uh, the infants who died at our institution in like seven years 
about half of them had a genetic evaluation and about 22% had a molecular or cytogenetic diagnosis. And, that, and I think this number will keep going up as, as, uh, as we try to uh, do, apply these technologies more often. This is a little bit older, older time frame that I'm looking at. And then I'm going to quickly talk about the implementation of genomics in the resource poor NICUs and the study that we were recently funded to study this. So we have created a, this virtual genome center for infant health that supports genoming sequencing in sick newborns. It's a proof of concept implementation study in which, in which we will examine a no, novel care model to deliver genomic medicine to newborns. And we are working to implement uh, this approach in four NICUs in the U.S. that cater to underserved, under-resourced populations. So these are the four sites. I'm not going to get into too much detail, but they, if you see, most of the patients are on Medicaid, the, the one that are government-funded, uh, majority are uh, catering to African-Americans or Hispanic population. And this is the team and uh, a lot of uh, people that are involved, but uh, I'm very fortunate to work in a, in a setup like this where I can have the best people to work with me. These are the four sites uh, uh, that we are working with. Uh, some of you may know Dr. Bandari. He's uh, also ex-PGI alumni and a cl close collaborator. And uh, so uh, we, ju we just want to, just a little bit of background that why we are doing this. We think that, as you know, genomic medicine has advanced rapidly in the past decade. And it has great promise at diagnosing rare and unexplained conditions. And 20 to 30% of babies admitted to level four NICUs have an underlying genetic condition. So, and the other problem is that genomic sequencing is still the standard of care, even in the US, in only a few NICUs. Very fortunate uh, NICUs that are well funded and well resourced are the only ones that are able to do this type of approach in the NICU. And they are often discharged to other places. And then clinicians are not aware of the past advances in genomic medicine. Uh, and also in the U.S., there is some mistrust of the medical community, especially among underrepresented populations. So our, ben our potential benefits are that we can keep the infants and families in the local environment. They don't need to be transferred. We're going to work remotely with the local medical team, and uh, that may improve the trust and satisfaction among families. Uh, and they can, uh, with the local system, it can also uh, support implementation of the highest standards of genomic care using a virtual platform. You can make an early diagnosis and gain broader understanding of experiences among low-income families. And this is just a, uh, just our uh, way to explain this aim one is to build this uh, center uh, and enroll 250 newborns with likely genetic condition, and then uh, facilitate sequencing, create, create a comprehensive clinical interpretive reports and reanalyze data and then examine comprehensive implementation outcomes and look at the appropriateness, visibility, penetration, equity, satisfaction, parental mental health, and newborn clinical outcomes. So pretty comprehensive study that we are embarking on. In fact, we are going to start enrolling our first patient, patient uh, next, next month. And lastly, I want to talk about uh, why there's so much of uh, focus on, uh, on this, uh, this genomic sequencing. I don't know if you saw this paper, this was published in 2019, where our team uh, and Dr. Tim Yu, who's my collaborator, uh, we could uh, not only diagnose this patient, but also develop a precise therapy uh, for her uh, by using her data and uh, antisense based oligonucleotide therapy was developed that slowed down her disease uh, for a few years, but finally, um, unfortunately, she passed away. But this was an example of how NF1 or precision medicine can can uh, take take root and take shape in, in, in as we move forward. And lastly, I want to talk about our neonatal genomics program that we established. And as the director of the program, I have four faculty, two fellows, a genetic counselor, and a research assistant. Our, and our goals include rapid exome sequencing in the NICU, molecular autopsy, how we can reanalyze data, integrate the sequencing with RNA-seq and uh, genomes, and other sequencing approaches, uh, functional analysis using cellular animal models, uh, integrate with community NICUs that I showed you earlier. And then we are also building a NICU biorepository for conditions that we don't understand at all. And, uh, and they, they, they are potential for some real discoveries there and then develop personalized therapeutics. Uh, uh, and then lastly, uh, in terms of summary, I hope I've convinced you that it's a vast area of clinical application and translational research. It can rapidly detect most pathogenic variants and it can have 
very high diagnostic yields. It can uh, decrease time to diagnosis. Uh, it can impact clinical care. It can, uh, it can, its utility is now increasingly perceived by the clinicians and parents. And we have integrated uh, genomic sequencing into our cl clinical care in our NICU as most often the first tier sequencing test. Uh, and then infants who have a neurologic phenotypes like hypertonia or seizures or multiple congenital anomalies are more likely to be diagnosed with these, uh, this approach. And other areas where uh, this approach can be beneficial is molecular autopsy. And we need to increase access to genomic sequencing in all NICUs. And uh, the role of sequencing as a screening tool for healthy newborns in needs for exploration. So that's some research that we are already doing and hopefully we'll hear more about it in the future. With that I would uh, end my talk and I want to acknowledge my laboratory team members, the Menton Center Gene Discovery Corps, my own division of genetic genomics and newborn medicine. And these are my funding sources, including the, uh, funding from NIH for my Vigor study and uh, other funding sources. And the, because of Bella, Foundation, the family that have been uh, doing fundraising for for the lab uh, to support uh, our work in newborn sequencing. That I'll end my talk, and I hope we have enough time for discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ankaj, for that extensive presentation. In fact, it has been an eye-opening journey for most of us. Okay. And that uh, tells us how little we know about this fascinating topic. And that was precisely the reason we thought that we would have uh, equally eminent people from India, Neerja and Alpana on board. Because for us as primary neonatologists, and I'm sure Praveen Venkatgiri would also agree with me, most of these things which you talked are really very futuristic, but equally promising and having a great potential of grassroots level translation in the Indian subcontinent. There are numerous newborns, I'm sure we all see most of my neonatology colleagues who are on this uh, panel today, as well as in the participants, would agree that there are multiple cases where there is hypotonia, where there is unexplained sudden deterioration. And at the most, we are able to conduct an autopsy. And in most of the situations that you would agree, most of the time, the parents even uh, refuse for an autopsy. Like in Lady Harding Metal College, where I work in New Delhi, most of the time, the DM residents are getting a refusal for consent for autopsy. You talked about molecular autopsy. I think that is something which is the future. Later on in the course, we would like to hear more about you. So I would like to open this by quick remarks from Nirja and Alpana. And then uh, there are two questions. We'll take that. And also request Madhulika ma'am later in the part to give her expect comment, expert comments in the closing. So over to you, Neerja, your comments on the presentation and your inputs of translation of these techniques. What do you see over the next 10 years in India? You are in the pioneer institution running the genetics division at All India Institute. So we would like to hear the translational potential from Pankaj's work and the role of collaboration with Harvard Medical School in the Indian setting. So, thank you so much for a very nice um, and comprehensive uh, you know, talk, which actually covered all the aspects of uh, genomics uh, in the neonatology, uh, in the patients uh, being cared at the at NICU. So, um, uh, if we uh, look into the uh, application of genomics in uh, NICU. So uh, there have been advancements here in India also, and mainly in the tertiary care center. Like um, uh, the genomics is accessible now, but however, the rapidity of genomic results may not be there it, because it requires, uh, most of the time it requires, uh, so there are so many pillars to, to the, to get a quick results. So you need to obtain the sample, transfer it to the lab, lab, lab and get the uh, information report through the lab. So, so there is a uh, delay in getting the reporting in especially any ICU care patient. So we have also tried to look into this by cutting down on the uh, interpretation part 
So uh, try, we are trying to outsource the wet lab part and getting the raw data and getting it analyzed so that we can give the answers in one day or maximum two day. Uh, thesis is being done for the ICU patients. So I, I'm sure that in one or two other genetic center also, the, such studies have been planned. So uh, we uh, feel that this will be these uh, the such kind of studies will be useful in nursery setting but obviously we are not ready for the healthy newborns genomics as there are so many issues to tackle with and uh, for uh, regarding the autopsy part many parents do agree for autopsy we need to explain it to them properly that so what what benefit they are going to have by getting the autopsy done both the uh, conventional autopsy as well as the molecular autopsy, which means that we need to save the samples so that, that, so that the testing can be done later on. So uh, because of the storage of the sample, the, the uh, families can be helped for, for uh, the future pregnancies. But for the newborn, it is very, very important to uh, for the critically sick newborn, and if, especially if the diagnosis is not certain, then it is imperative to save the DNA. Uh, if we, we were not able, we are not able to perform the testing. And the second uh, one important constraint for this genomic testing is that it is an out-of-pocket expenditure for the you know, families, and the cost uh, is going to be high. And uh, so it varies from 10 to 25,000 and uh, then also the quality also varies uh, likewise. So, and it also depends that what type of uh, test we are planning to choose, whether it is clinical exome sequencing, where, which means that we are just looking for few numbers of genes, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, the omim morbid genes, or it is whole exome sequencing, which means the 20,000 genes. And whole genome sequencing, I don't think that uh, it is being used for the NICU setting as well. It is still in the research use and we use it when whole exome sequencing is not useful for a, uh, for a suspected monogenic etiology. So, uh, so the cost constraint and the time constraint, these are two important factors which actually hinders this, um, uh, this type of testing in the routine use. So this is one thing, but yes, in research, the studies are undergoing and we need to see that how, uh, what are the results of these studies so that we um, are able to uh, draw a conclusion whether it is possible, feasible in Indian setting or not. And uh, maybe if we have centers in-house, uh, like the wet lab analysis uh, and the raw data analysis, uh, then the cost may be uh, uh, cut down and then uh, maybe a quick results are possible because then you are no, there is no transport response uh, delay, transport delay is involved. So it is just in-house in under one roof. If such setting exists, then it may be possible uh, to get that. And obviously the counseling part is very, very important whenever we are ordering such kind of testing, the pre-test counseling, the post-test counseling because of the incidental findings and all with, uh, which one may um, get if you have so much of information. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Over to you, Pankaj, for any inputs on uh, Neerja's uh, observations. You're very right, Neerja. Uh, the two major bottlenecks which I, as a clinician or a bedside unit, also faced. One is that uh, transporting the samples, creating awareness in the community for out-of-pocket expense, which will have a forbearing on a future uh, pregnancy, you know, and the outcomes in the family. And the third is the turnover time. Often the families are migrants and they're lost to follow up. By the time the report arrives, we cannot trace them. So Pankaj, these are some of the issues and the challenges. So a quick yeah. rejoinder from your side before we move to Dr. Alpana. Yeah, no, I think these are I think these are all problems that are potentially solvable. And I think the push is should also come from neonatologists as the major player in this, that we need faster answers. Like I will tell you, I'm not trying to blame the geneticists, but from our institution, getting the, to this point needed a lot of push from us uh, to say that we need a quick answer. It really affects. But a lot of time, uh, a, a clinician will say, oh yeah, we'll send the test when the patient comes as an outpatient and we'll get the results. But 
often they don't understand how critical it is to get the answer as fast as possible. So we need a collaboration between unitologists and geneticists to say, we need a quick answer. We cannot wait for three months, two months, or one month to get an answer. And also we need to develop institutions like AIMS and PGI and others where this type of work can be done, where this type of data can, these families can be enrolled in a study. And if we don't find an answer, they can, the data can, raw data can be collected and then analyzed by the team, by experts. So as, as I said, I have a whole team of people who are just doing this and we meet every once a week and we, all the genetics people, they all send up patients to us to enroll them, to reanalyze the data and then come up with answers and even do modeling as needed. And I, someone asked about the VUSs. VUS is also, sometimes VUSs need a traditional functional analysis or, uh, or sometimes just getting more family information uh, or enroll more number of patients from the, more number of uh, individuals from the family can also get to you to the bottom line of the cause. So VUS is often, uh, it can be solved in a lot of cases, not all cases, but a lot of cases. So I think there are different approaches, but I think this is where leadership has to be taken by big centers to really push this to the community hospitals and say that how useful it is. And seeing is believing. I would say that when we started doing it, a lot of neonatologists were like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And does it really, they don't see the benefits because they say, oh, even if we find a diagnosis, it's not gonna change the treatment. But we see that in so many ways, it does help the family and the care that the child gets. So that is something that needs to be pushed as well. So. I hope I'm not trying to blame the geneticists, but I just feel like the time frame for neonatologists and geneticists often is not in sync. And I think that's where uh, neonatologists should, we need to push that we need an answer and what can we do to best do it. And uh, everyone needs to push for this. And I think it's totally doable. The if sequencing companies should also be pushed to say that you need to give us the data within three days. It's totally doable. This is just, there's so many, and they, this can be a QI study. We are doing this in our, center as a QI study where we are trying to cut short the time it takes from uh, finding a patient to getting the data to results. And, and we are trying to cut short uh, uh, like uh, the time taken from, from the process time of enrollment to the time of results. Uh, so all the bottlenecks that come with that are being sorted out. So it's an evolution and it's an approach that needs help from everyone in, who have a skin in the game. So uh, we cannot just uh, send uh, tell geneticists to take over from there. Thank you so much, uh, Pankaj. I think that was perfect. And uh, it's heartening to know that uh, uh, your center is also using uh, quality improvement to cut down on the reporting time. And mm -hmm. I think uh, Dr. Nirja, NQCN and its national network has been pioneering into point of care quality improvement methodologies to cut down on the reporting time, diagnostic time, patient wait time and multiple, you know, uh, patient safety issues. Now, I will come to Surinder. Uh, Surinder, I think we had uh, uh, received the answer to your question, but I will definitely come to you subsequently. So first, I would be requesting our other uh, distinguished panelists, Dr. Alpana Razdan. Dr. Na, uh, Dr. Alpana is uh, belonging to the Gene Strings company, and Dr. Alpana has been credited. Her company has brought molecular and genomic analysis in studying uh, some of the very common uh, diseases which are increasing rapidly in prevalence and incidence in our country, that is autism spectrum disorders as a part of the ICMR funded project. So Dr. Alpana, I would like to know more about your insights on the translational capacity of the work which you are doing and what uh, potential do you see in collaborating with what Dr. Pankaj has mentioned from the Harvard School of Medicine and bringing it to India at a low cost and rapid turnover time so that a neonatologist like us can benefit and get it mainstreamed into neonatal practice? Over to you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, see, in a diagnostic setting, uh, the goal of whole genome sequencing or genome scale sequencing is to identify genetic variants that provide a molecular etiology for the symptoms. All other variants are incidental findings, and uh, these additional uh, findings differ widely with regard to predictive capacity and clinical accountability. Not surprisingly, uh, there is disagreement about how much genetic information should be routinely returned in a pediatric setting. So the application of genomic sequencing uh, if we do in asymptomatic newborns, intensifies many of these challenges and exposes uh, 
the societal deep societal questions and preservation of each child's open future. Uh, the economics of such screening is uh, very high and uh, must be considered before implementing it on a population level. Although the technical features needed for uh, genome sequencing appear feasible, an interpretation uh, of each asymptomatic patient's uh, variant profile will be labor intensive and uh, for the foreseeable future and uh, clinically useful prediction of future disease may prove elusive. So for us as a diagnostic center, it is always a challenge that uh, we are getting these uh, variants of unknown significance, which we do not know what to do with them. So the only thing that we can do with them is either go back to the family and if the other samples from the family are available, we do a uh, inheritance study. But most of the times these are left like that. And, uh, but we have to report these variants because sometimes in the near future, they might, be, uh, they might turn out to be uh, useful for the uh, uh, sample that we're testing or the patient we're testing. So, uh, and in also, uh, like right now in India, there is a lot of newborn screening going on for all these uh, babies that are being born. But most of the times they come up with uh, as false positives. Uh, and there is no further studies as to how uh, they're going to affect the uh, child or is there any uh, medication or anything which we can do to uh, reduce the risk of these uh, uh, positive uh, uh, reports that, that come out. So, uh, so the potential of genomic information is to alert the clinician to reconsider the family history, interpret physical examinations in a new light and uh, ability to benefit other family members before they develop the disease. So recessive carrier traits uh, detected in your bonds could alert the patient parents to genetic risks that provide information or to reproductive plan planning. So all these factors uh, are very critical when you are uh, 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 giving genome sequencing as, an, as a solution. But um, we have to look at the costs as well. We have to look at other uh, uh, the tangible resources that we have, whether the expertise is there. The genetic counselors are very, is, a, is a severe dirt in the country. So we, we need to Im improve on that uh, infrastructure and get more genetic counselors which can uh, interpret these reports because when we send these reports to the clinicians, they do not uh, uh, interpret the report properly and they do not know what to do with the report unless and until it is uh, explained to them. So all these factors I think require uh, deep uh, thinking and uh, pro uh, construction of a network kind of a thing which can um, highlight, which can address these issues uh, towards the collective uh, goal of uh, providing the best of healthcare to these uh, children. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Alpana. I think, uh, Pankaj, we have a couple of questions. We have uh, Dr. Amol Joshi. Uh, Dr. Amol Joshi is uh, Associate Professor of Neonatology running the DM program at Aurangabad Medical College, Maharashtra, and a great uh, QI proponent. Uh, Amol, please go ahead with your question. You can unmute yourself. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker, Dr. Agarwal, sir, and Dr. Alpana, and Dr. Mirza, ma'am. Uh, I think I'm audible. Yes. Yeah, you're yeah. audible. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my question is uh, regarding the Indian settings uh, for differentiating the genome uh, from healthy and unhealthy or a normal from an abnormal, do we have a reference for Indian settings? Do we have data to uh, say that, okay, these many newborns are normal and this is abnormal to differentiate, number one. And number two, cost effectivity analysis of uh, doing it in at-risk settings in uh, uh, in NICU, as you said. So, uh, over to you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, there is definite data on Indian setting South Asian. There is a big database of, I don't know if people know about NOMAD database. There is a there is a database from Broad Institute that includes a huge number of South Asian uh, people as well. So there are ways to check that. And I, I use it all the time. I'm, several of my patients are of South Asian origin. So there is no problem with that. And in terms of cost effectiveness, it has been shown repeatedly that it's a very cost effective method 
of cutting costs in the NICU. And regarding newborn uh, screening, what you said, uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, Como, uh, there, uh, oh, sorry, not Como, sorry, Dr. Alpana, uh, about uh, the newborn genome sequencing in the healthy newborn, I don't think it's ready for prime time yet. There needs to be more research. In fact, UK, England is going to start a study in next maybe year or so. And there are more studies being planned to really know the utility of it. And unless we attribute all variants to their penetrance and how important they are, as our study showed, there's still a lot of controversy. So I don't think it's ready for prime time, but uh, there is more need for uh, screening, maybe creating a subset of sequencing for newborn related conditions or things like that, maybe, of, uh, maybe in order in the future. In terms of genetic counseling, you brought up a very important point, and I cannot agree more that there is a need for a whole system of genetic counselors in, in India that can take this challenge. And uh, uh, that's a huge challenge for clinicians, even in the US, they just cannot interpret the reports uh, and they don't feel comfortable or confident about uh, interpreting the reports. So there is a need for an infrastructure of uh, genetic counselors who can, who can uh, help clinicians with this job. So uh, I fully agree with you. Sorry. We are running short of time, but I'll very quickly take two more questions if Pankaj allows me. I know uh, it's early morning in Boston and you may be having... No, no, I'm, I have time, so I'm open. I, okay, I'm thank problem. you so much, Pankaj. So I think then that gives me the latitude for three questions. Very quickly, we have uh, Uma Maheshwari. Uma Maheshwari is doing uh, great research at Sri Ramachandra Medical College, Chennai. So Uma, what do you for your observations and your questions for Pankaj? Um, good evening, sir. Uh, thank you for allowing me to ask. Uh, in fact, like uh, I have shared one of the article which we published as uh, um, uh, from um, uh, Sri Ramchandra clinical exome sequencing in newborn. Uh, in fact, I have uh, interacted with Dr. Pankaj. Then we are supposed to have Zoom meet following that, which we have not done yet. Um, so basically, um, uh, basically, I think for newborn screening, we are not yet as uh, as already discussed. I think uh, we are not in that pace as such. Um, and also I want to, because genetic testing is available, we should not be skipping the routine thing which we are doing. Uh, so I, uh, I'm sure uh, ma'am also would agree that uh, uh, it, now genetic testing is available freely, even without like knowing the phenotype or having a proper uh, phenotype pick thing. They, it is being fast forwarded and they skip certain tests. I think that is not going to help. I think we have to still stick on to um, the basic testing and then proceed to genetic testing. Uh, that is when like... Uh, we could get an answer for a variant of uncertain significance. Um, so, and also I agree that we should have capacity building. Uh, so it's not enough that like one group uh, is having all knowledge about genetic interpretation. We should have more courses for the clinicians, uh, what test to ask in which condition, uh, and uh, um, and we should uh, go as a capacity building. We should take everyone along the path. It's not enough that they just do the genetic testing, but they should have some knowledge on interpretation as well. Um, so um, I think uh, that is uh, my, uh, uh, I, I just wanted to share this thing. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to uh, share my views. Uh, <clears throat> So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uma. Uh, Pankaj, I think before we conclude with Dr. Madhulika's uh, comments, I am, as a neonatologist, uh, really excited by this virtual genome center which you are piloting in the US. And in fact, I was, uh, you know, uh, reading about it in your Facebook post earlier uh, this year when it was launched, and I was pretty excited with it. And I see great translational potential into this type of virtual genomic center. And as you already rightly mentioned, that centers of excellence in the country and uh, like AIMS, PGI or some other centers can take up, uh, you know, tasks like this with piloting. And we have got representation from both the centers, especially from South India as well as from North India, where some research is being done in this direction. So I would just like to hear from you and from your experience. I know it's pretty early. But still, uh, where do you see? Do you see such centers uh, coming up in India as well over the course of the decade? And uh, or do you think there should be a national policy 
which we in the ministries of health should advocate as a part of the quality improvement muskan programs or the other programs with ministry of health child health division is taking forward because we have some advocacy status in the ministry so we could probably advocate and request the governments to look at this futuristic uh, part over the next decade so what are your inputs on this yeah i think it probably needs both i think that a lot of initiatives on the big institutions and try to do like funding from like private foundations and reach out to whatever sources you can and sort of establishing these type of centers because that's what would be needed but at the same time if government can sort of pitch in and help with this that would be amazing because that would sort of uh, further help this process but we cannot wait for the government to act uh, it would be great to have the, like this type of centers being done at uh, at different institutions and i think nicu is just a start as you know there are pqs there are other centers other places where this technology can be uh, hugely helpful and uh, and that's that's where i i think having this type of approach will be great but uh, yeah so thank you so much uh, dr surender before we end any comments from your side you were talking about the ppp mode i think it would be great uh, so uh, so um, good that uh, you said uh, dr hi dr pankaj i think i met yeah. you in uh, hyderabad yep. or in yes. some new con uh, yeah. nice and it was nice listening to everything uh, so i was approached by uh, uh, the faculty from jamia and uh, jnu and they wanted they had uh, the funding from somewhere from this and they have a ppp model of establishing guarantee lab so that time in delhi uh, sir uh, dr vikram datta since you will be at the helm of affairs in lady harding medical college and under your leadership in after one and a half year or so i think lady harding will be an institute of uh, the repute for genetic as well like uh, monarnath medical college is already doing it it's not just limited to one or two aims of pgi there can be so many yeah. aims together and now so many now noida pgi hospital is already started genetic testing so there are more institutions institute which should come up and if you need uh, dr vikram there is a model now which they want to do it uh, with funding uh, they had some funding from somewhere and they can do it uh, in your place as well so you you have to provide uh, the lab uh, the space and things and they can start up Uh, at your plate as thank you so much surinder i think uh, that is really very visionary on your part i think we need as the more the merrier i would say well, it's not yeah. that putting all the load on two premier institutions of the country i think like uma has very rightly mentioned and they are already collaborating with pankaj and that is the reason we have pankaj on board today on this collaborative communities of practice so that everybody is sensitized the main reason for the session is the sensitization and the futuristic potential of this modality and the awareness so with this i am afraid uh, uh, this discussion is wonderful and very engrossing but i would uh, respect the time of everybody it's late evening in delhi and early morning in uh, boston uh, so i would request dr kabra uh, the senior most faculty uh, of genetics and our senior to please go ahead and give her insights and ma'am what is the way forward and any take home messages before praveen venkatgiri concludes the whole session over to you dr kabra ma'am thank you very much dr vikram i really enjoyed the session excellent talk and discussion i think the gist has uh, already come out during the discussion but there are just few points which i would just like to highlight so as uh, nirja said technology is not an issue in india as of now there are multiple centers uh, offering next generation sequencing and um, uh, it is it is accessible the issue is the cost and the turnaround time which has also been highlighted now uh, i think uh, dr pankaj would agree that the debate of uh, phenotype first labs first or genotype first or genomics first is is on even world over so i think presently as you correctly said screening all newborns uh, using genomics is is not a priority and i think it's not being offered anywhere and it is definitely not possible in india as of now because we are not uh, even doing routine newborn screening for common or disorders uh what i uh, feel is that uh, this can be restricted first is that we really need to do pilots 
uh, Nirja is working on one, uh, then there are many other institutions which are working and the results which will come out uh, from these pilots would definitely pave way to uh, sort of highlight the importance of such studies. And then probably gradually uh, it could be taken up as, uh, as a screening uh, in newborns depending on what we finally get. I think uh, the presently, um, we are all geared up to definitely undiagnosed sick newborns uh, and even older children and infants. Uh, I mean, it's not restricted to newborns uh, and it should definitely be tried to do uh, in that situations. I, I know that, um, uh, I mean, feasibility, pri primarily cost is an issue because uh, the, there is no government support all the time for these costly tests. The other thing which probably uh, would be useful uh, in uh, this scenario would be maybe picking up high-risk cases, as Dr. Pankaj also said, who were missed during antenatal period. Because what we try to do is that we try to pick up high-risk mothers in the antenatal period, high-risk couples, and try to do their carrier exomes in the antenatal period itself. So undiagnosed sick newborns or sick infants or with high-risk factors, red flags for genetic disorders could be taken up. And we make sure that the turnaround time is such that we can act. We can act on the findings, and the families and the babies can be helped. So I think uh, this, and then definitely pilots in collaboration. Uh, Dr. Pankaj, we would be really helpful because you have got extensive experience to work on uh, these pilots and bring out some good results from India as well. Uh, that's from my side. I just had one quick question to uh, Dr. Pankaj. Uh, in your uh, study, uh, how did you limit the uh, reporting? I mean, I saw one of the variants was for BRCA also. So do you uh, ask the labs or during your research to restrict to related findings or take consents from the parents that what kind of findings do they want? I think Alpana touched upon this and I think this is, uh, you also highlighted. So just a quick answer on that. Thank you very much, Dr. Vikram for involving me. Thanks a lot. Yeah. No, thank you, the, Dr. Madhulika. That was great uh, comments you made. And I think the secondary findings or incidental findings are always a concern. And we do take consent from families when we enroll them, if they want to hear about secondary findings or not. Uh, uh, and then most of the time, we are only focusing on the, I think it's, I don't know what's the latest number for ACMG guideline genes. They're like 73 or so. And that, that's what we focus on at this time. And then BRCA2, we initially did not include, but then incidentally, we found in a child who had died, in fact, and then we found also that the family had an extensive history of uh, different conditions uh, like ovarian cancer and breast cancer. So then we reached out to our IRB and then added a couple of these type BRCA1, BRCA2, and one more gene as part of adult onset conditions uh, to be part of the newborn screen, uh, uh, part of the newborn sequencing project. But Again, as everyone alluded to, that it's not the time to think about healthy newborn sequencing. This is not the time. There's a lot more research that needs to be done. And I think we should focus on the low hanging fruit, which is the sequencing uh, undiagnosed or difficult to diagnose or uh, potential genetic conditions at this time. Thank you, Dr. Pankaj. Thank you very much. I can see that Dr. Nagesh, Karthik Nagesh is also on the, uh, has joined. So I know Karthik so well. Thank you, Karthik, for joining as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Agrawal. Um, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Dr. Razdan, as well as Dr. Gupta, uh, for this excellent session. Um, we know that the this is a niche area, and uh, you know we in India have to work on that. Uh, there's quite a lot of uh, uh, focus on the IVF, and followed by you know single uh, a child, and uh, uh, a lot of resources have been utilized for this. So uh, public as well as the private sectors could work more towards it as um, Uma, uh, Surinder, uh, everyone uh, were pointing out, there's a lot of work to be done. And that's the idea of sharing this platform where your experiences are shared so that the new ideas will come. And we follow that up uh, uh, in our own fields as such. And that's the essence of quality. And thank you so much uh, uh, for uh, sparing your time and sharing uh, valuable information to all of us. And thank you everyone for uh, coming on the uh, 15th of August holiday uh, and joining us. Uh, you know, we thank you sincerely. 
And uh, of course, uh, uh, we thank WHO for uh, providing us the platform, um, as well as our uh, uh, team, office team, um, and of course, uh, Dr. Kapra as well for your uh, final remarks, as well as the encouragement. Um, so Dr. Rahul, Sonam, and Komal uh, worked for this uh, and, and uh, provided uh, the, an excellent session. Uh, kindly give us your feedback so that we constantly want to know what you want to hear and how we can work or follow up after these sessions. That's extremely important. It just takes a few more minutes of your time. Please do give feedback and join us in our uh, uh, group as NQSN. Everyone is welcome. The links have been provided. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so thank much, you so Praveen. Much. And thank, thank you, you most uh, eminent panelists, especially Dr. Pankaj, Dr. Nirja, Alpana. Madhulika ma'am and all my colleagues from NQCN and NNF and all the frontline teams and participants from across the country and abroad. We look forward to an excellent series of deliberations and Pankaj, I'm sure you have ignited uh, the fire here. And this is going to, I think over the next decade, this is going to find, you know, roots into the health system of this country and mean a lot of high quality change in the quality of life of children who otherwise would be lost to undiagnosed genetic disorders. Thank you so much. Stay safe and wishing all of you a very happy Independence Day again. Looking Thank forward you. to meeting you at the subsequent communities of practice session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.